through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic. Hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin. I'm Spencer, and today I'm joined by film superstar is that a fair term uh lynn shelton you uh in the world of seattle film you're kind of the shit like just just like sum it up that basically it's kind of amazing in some ways you know seattle is one of those little burgeoning markets and it continues to grow but you kind of are the face (laughs) of seattle film whether you want to be or not and it's kind of interesting to think about, though, because your feature debut, We Go Way Back, was what, 2006? Mm-hmm. So this is, this is just six years later, and you've really become the face of the Seattle film world. How, how has that been? You know, like, I, I mean, I don't imagine, maybe you do, maybe you inspire to be like a big deal when you were first starting out as a filmmaker, but I kind of get the impression, at least from my experience, that most indie filmmakers just kind of want to make films and have their films be seen. What, what was that what you were thinking when you first got started? Fame. (laughs) Yes. No, or or just wanting to get your films. (laughs) Yeah, no, I just wanted to keep making movies. I mean, when I made my first feature, it was so transformative. Mm. Uh, um, I'd been an artist for a long time, but it wasn't until I made, I I discovered that particular art form of writing and directing a feature film that I felt like, okay, this is where I was always meant to be. This is where, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. And I just, yeah, I was on fire. I was an addict immediately (laughs) and I couldn't wait to make the next one. And, and it's always been about that, you know, how can I just, what's the next project? How can I put it together? How can I get on set again as quickly as possible? It's funny though, because like, I, and, and perhaps you can clarify some of this, whether it's fact or fiction, because, you know, whatever, whatever's out there kind of like swirls. But um, number one, your background is originally in photography. You've done a lot of photography work. Is that correct? Well, it depends on how far back you want to go, right. Spencer. Fair enough. Fair when enough. I was a eight, I was a poet. It's true. Like I've always, I've, I've tried lots of different art, art forms. You know, um, I got into acting first, really, before. Yes, that is true. You do. You have done quite. You still do quite a bit. I do a little bit here and there, but um, not like I used to. I used to just that was my it really art has always been an addiction. Mm -hmm. So I used to have to be I was always in a show, you know, and I went to the University of Washington. I graduated from the School of Drama. That was my B.A. Um, And I I was lucky enough to get cast in a lot of stuff. And if I wasn't Mm -hmm. in a main stage show, I was in a workshop. I was just go, 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 going. And I actually applied to grad school for acting, um, but I really wanted to move to New York City. So I just applied to one grad school, which was NYU. And I got called back with Garrett Dillahunt wow. and he got in and I got waitlisted and I didn't get in. And, and I'm, I often look back at that moment and think about what my life would be like now if I had. And I'm grateful that I didn't because I love the life I have now. Mm. So um, after doing some, some downtown theater acting, mostly in, in, in New York, um, I ended up my second love had always been photography. So I ended up, um, I don't know, just, I kind of had a falling out with acting. And so, um, I ended up applying to grad school in photography and getting into, into the school of visual arts. And there was sort of an open enough program mm. that I could take a video workshop and I could take a filmmaking, 60 millimeter filmmaking class. And I could, and that was really where I started to make movies, but it was all handcrafted, small experimental films and, um, and uh, experimental documentaries. And my marketable skill coming out of school was editing, digital editing, which was sort of new, that's, newish that's a, at yeah, the time. Yeah, it's good to get ahead of that curve. Yeah, yeah. so I started teaching um, part-time, and then I also was freelance editing, and and I, that was all in New York. So I grew up in Seattle. I lived in New York through the 90s, basically, and then mm. moved back here in 99 um, and started getting the opportunity to edit narrative stuff, which is um, – which is an advantage of being in a smaller market mm-hmm. because I didn't have to go up through the ranks, rise right. up through the ranks of um, assistant editing or, you know, whatever it is that you have to do to start editing feature films in, you know, L.A. or New York. So it's, it's kind of nice to have that sort of small community because it's it constantly <laughs> amazes me that, you know, they talk about things like six degrees of separation and whatever. And in Seattle, it feels like two, two. max. Exactly. Like, I know somebody who knows you, who knows somebody <laughs> totally. else. It's like, that, that, yeah. like that's it. And, and I used to think it was one. Like, I used to really feel like I must know everybody. But it's I love the fact that I keep hearing about, you know, I just heard yesterday about a, a feature that's shooting in the summer. And I 
I don't know the director. I don't know. You know, I was like, who's shooting? Who's directing it? Who's shooting it? You know, and and all these names were new to me. And I that just makes me really excited because it makes me feel like it's just, you know, it's really growing, growing and yeah. growing and growing. Yeah. So, you know, the other thing that I thought was pretty wild, and I don't know if this is factually true or not, did you work on a fishing trawler or something at some point? I did. Because that sounds pretty awesome, like <laughs> Deadliest Catch style. Yeah, it was a little Deadliest Catch style, except that the it, it was, the, you know, I think over the length of a football field or two or something. Whoa. It was huge. It was a big factory trawler. So it had a factory to make surimi, which is what they make fake crab meat out of interesting but it, we were making the fine kind that they just eat as fish paste i guess in japan hmm. so we would catch uh pollock in these hundred ton nets <laughs> these huge snake net you know this big net uh-huh. would come up on and then they dump it into the factory below and i was on the head twisting you know the the machine is supposed to do it all but sometimes they miss a few so i would twist the heads off of the ones that didn't quite make it and i have terrible motion sickness so i was yeah I would... just wanted to die the entire time. I was so miserable. I was so seasick until four weeks in. That's all it took. Four weeks. Um, right. And I got my sea legs and then nothing could... We had, we went through a, a, like, what was it? A typhoon or... A, Whoa. It was terrifying. Yeah, these like 40-foot waves. <laughs> Everybody on... Every single person on the boat was retching except for me. I was like... So... <laughs> but then it all came back again. Um, yeah, I was there for... I was on that boat for about three months. Wow. And... Uh, it was uh, it was it was an interesting experience. I would I would imagine like yeah. I just reading that I was like, um, yeah, all right, that sounds <laughs> that sounds pretty pretty yeah. hardcore. Now it is simply fodder for cocktail parties. <laughs> but I, but um, yeah, it was. I'm I mean I'm glad I went through it. So, I guess. I mean you've you've done <laughs> photography, you've done editing, you've done fisher fish, fish boat head trawling, twisting. Yeah. Uh-huh. At what point did you know that it was, you know, the right time to make a film? I mean, had it been something that had been bouncing in your head? I mean, that's yeah. what, 2006, you said you came back to Seattle in 99. Mm-hmm. So there's like, you know, five, six years there that existed before you made the oh, film. Yeah. Like, how did that finally come that, you know, like, I've been in the film world so much, like, I just need to do it? Was it oh, like, yeah. a, well, like a stance like I that? Know, I'd always loved films and I'd always... I'd always been drawn. In fact, when I applied for grad school for acting, I remember thinking to myself, well, do you want to apply for acting or do you want to apply for film school? Because I I always loved film, but I was just, for me, it took a long time for me to build up the confidence and the kind of life wisdom and maturity to become, to feel like I could lead the the crew, you know, and to, mm. and to actually ask all these people to help me fulfill a vision uh, of a feature film. I don't know. It was, it was a... It, I was a late bloomer. I really was. And so it was, <laughs> even though I always loved it, it just, it kind of, what happened for me was just the few years before um, I was editing, the first time I edited a, a narrative feature film, which was a, um, a film written and directed by a local uh, talent named Alec Carlin. And it was produced by Carlos Gunduzzi, who's now the um, uh, executive director, I think, of ACT. He's wow. the head of ACT um, Theater. And, um, and they on the basis of this little dance film I'd made for Dana Hansen, who's just about to be posting her, or is, is almost finished posting her, uh, her first feature film. It's all, it all, it's just a tangled web. It is. Um, this little short that she and Galen Hansen in the, in the form of 33 Fainting Spells, they made a film called Measure, which was this eight minute dance film. And on the basis of that film and my editing of that film, um, Carlo and Alec asked me to edit this feature. And in that process of editing a feature film, that was kind of really where I learned mm. cin- narrative cinematic storytelling. And I started to harbor this secret desire. This was like 2000, 2001, 2002, something in there. And I started thinking about I think I could do it. Like, I really feel like I want to, and I think I could now. But it was, I didn't, I don't think I told anybody (laughs) about this little desire. And then what happened for me was that uh, in 2005, at the end of 2000, no, no, the end of 2004, it was like December 2004, I got a call from Greg Lachow, who was uh, in the the head of this um, very short-lived nonprofit studio, film studio called The Film Company. And they asked five, I think, different filmmakers to make films with this group of people that they had hired to be their collaborator staff. And Ben Kasulki was one of them. He has 
receiving the mayor's award. Well, that's what I was going to say. Tonight. Like, that's one of the most noble things about we go b- way back is that mm-hmm. that's sort of the beginning of your, I guess, partnership with Ben. Yeah. Like, just as you've risen, he's everywhere as well. I exactly. Mean, so yeah. That seems like a perfect. We just shot place a new another film together that we it wrapped on oh, Saturday. I, I've heard. I've heard. Yeah. Yes. And um and Vinny Smith and and Ben Kasulki were the only two who I've made who've been with me through that whole thing. So Vinny started as the boom operator on uh, <laughs> We Go Way Back, but then ended up becoming the sound designer and mm. did all the post sound. And then on, on Hump Day and um, Your Sister's Sister, he composed all the music as well. So I feel like we've all evolved as artists, you know, through these years. And it's really, it's a nice feeling, you know, that every, and, and we've added to the family. I mean, there are now several other people that I've sure. worked with on several projects. Sure. I mean, it started off pretty much with a bang because you got, you won, let's see, the Grand Jury Prize at Slam Dance. Ben won the Vision Award for cinematography. Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty, pretty big place to start. But to me, like, and I've sort of seen these things retroactively, at least that one, uh, to me, you sort of came into my consciousness with my effortless brilliance yeah. because that was sort of the point at which mumblecore became a buzzword. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, let's say you were, you won the Indie Spirit Award for someone to watch. Mm-hmm. Um, you kind of, burst out of the Seattle scene. I think I think it's interesting to think about, you know, saying that you didn't feel mature enough mm-hmm. to lead a film. And I think, honestly, if you ask me, I think there are a lot of people who could really use some maturity before mm-hmm. being directors. <laughs> so it really, it really feels like you, it paid off doing that. In terms of my effort was brilliance, though, did you feel pressure to, you know, follow up your first one that was so successful in terms of winning, you know, grand jury prize and stuff? And, I mean, I guess it's before Mumblecore became a thing, so there wasn't any, like, pressure of that upon you. But just was it tough to kind of sit down and be like, you know, I got to hit another one out of the park? Like It was tougher to follow up Hump Day, frankly, because Hump Day felt like the film that kind of, you know, oh, that's got me a lot of love yeah. Yeah, from folks. And, and, I, and I, I was, I, for a while, I remember thinking, I don't know if I can please people as much as people seem to love this film. I mean, it wasn't everybody's cup of tea, but the people who liked it really, really seemed to like it a lot. Um, My Frills Brilliance actually was really, it was great because it was, it was so low stakes. I can't even tell you. I mean, I really was, it was an experiment. It was so cheap to make. um, And I, I asked, I borrowed equipment and I borrowed locations and I, you know, I mean, I really was just like trying to make it as cheaply as I could. And I sort of passed the hat and put money together in a nonprofit way. Um, I wasn't promising that anybody was going to make, you know, millions of dollars or whatever. You know, it was very, very small. And what was great about that was that you could do anything you wanted creatively. Like you really did have it, – it creates this incredible ease and space for risking. Mm. Um, and so I I went into this process. I, I want to see what it's like to do a fully improvised script. Um, I'll know what's going to happen in each scene, but I want – that I want the dialogue to be totally improvised. I want to really work collaboratively with the actors, figure out who these people are. I want to base characters on the people in some cases. And and then I don't know if what will happen in the edit room. You know, maybe it won't even be a movie, but um, I know I'll learn a lot. And I was looking for a way to find just extreme naturalism and make, make, make a film that almost felt like a doc, like a documentary. And that, um, that's really cool. I mean... And it, but sort of a funny thing though, because because you did that and you succeeded at doing it, did you kind of feel like that became an expectation of you as you headed into Hump Day? I mean, were people like, "Oh, this is her thing. She wants to do those natural improv-y type movies." Like that's Lynn Shelton. Well, then this. I mean, I told the people I wanted involved in Hump Day that that was what I wanted to do. I mean, it's a it's a, it's really a project by project thing for mm. me. So. Um, for instance, Touchy Feely, which is the film I just shot, feels completely different than the last three films, I think. Um, I mean, I think there's some overlap in style and, and naturalism, but it's it's not handheld. It's all on, on tripods. It's all wide shots, two shots, um, and over the shoulder, but it's it's still, it's, it's very static. Um, there's a lot of characters. There's a lot of storylines. There's a lot of locations. It, I made three films in a row that were... Two Small, or three characters, yeah. basically one location, and they all took place over the course of like three days, you know, like a long weekend. And it's great. That bare bones, you know, paradigm allows you to really 
really get to know the characters, really mm. explore the minutia and the nuances of what's going on, the interpersonal dynamics between everybody. And it's great, you know, but I really felt like I need to, I need to break out and need to do something different. And so this film, I'd say, is a lot more like uh, We Go Way Back in some ways. Hmm. I mean, there's some... There are some sub, there's some subjective filmmaking where you know people are going you're sort of exploring the inner psyches of these people and so you know I have some fun camera work and some there's mystery <laughs> and there's going to be you know the soundtrack will be very important and I mean it's really different than the last three films so but with Hump Day I did I said look here's my fullest brilliance I want to do this but I want to like these are my goals with the next mm. film I want that same level of naturalism but I want to do accomplish this and this and this with this film you know and in that case it was make a film that would like keep you on the edge of your seat at the end of every scene you'd be like oh, what's going to happen next and oh, oh, you know um and so every 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 project is a completely different um set of goals and you know and and a different aesthetic approach and well, I mean, pre touchy feely, you've got your sister sister coming out mm-hmm. now, which is the opening night film at SIF, which has got to be pretty gratifying as a gratifying, Seattle filmmaker. Yes, I mean, I, I, I forget. Indeed. I was reading something about like the last time that happened, and that was in the nineties or something. It's never happened. Never. Okay. There's never been a locally it, a local so filmmaker who's opened. That's a, a pretty awesome <laughs> yeah, accomplishment. It is. So, I mean, it was filmed. On one of the islands, was mm-hmm, it Bain? In the San Juan. San Juan. Okay. What was your sort of perspective going into that one? I mean, it seems like each film sort of, as you get to the next one, it kind of grows along with you in terms of, you know, who you're casting and stuff like that. What was your sort of impression going into this one? You know, as you spoke about Hump Day, you wanted something you'd be on your edge of your seat for each scene. Mm-hmm. What was that with this one? Well, Hump Day was shot almost completely in medium close-ups. And so I wanted this one to have um, a more of, <laughs> more of a visual sophistication. I thought it actually worked pretty well for that film because it, it's a it's a very kind of taut movie. And f- there's a lot of tension and mm. you want to see what's going on in people's faces. So it, it, I think it works fine. But um, with your sister, sister, I wanted to figure out a way to give more of a sense of place. Um, I wanted wider shots, and I wanted between the characters for their, you know, things to play out, and some two shots, and you know, there to be just more vocabulary in terms of the visual frames that you'd see as an audience member. Um, and then, I mean, that was probably the number one thing that I wanted to do with that film. I wanted the same sense, you know, I wanted that same sense of naturalism and that same sense of of um, you know, really believing that these characters were Mm -hmm. real. Um, And so the process was very similar. You know, Mark brought me the kernel of the idea. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was I changed. (laughs) He wanted the, instead of going up to this cabin and finding a sister, the older sister, he was going to meet, encounter the hot mother of his best friend. So I changed that to a sister because I thought that the sister relationship would be a nice thing to explore. And then I reset the whole thing in the Northwest because originally he had, when he was going to produce it, it was going to be over on the East Coast. So I knew it had to be an island from the very beginning. It had to take, take it place back on to the island. Northwest. That's right. What What is it like, though? You know, you've got Emily Blunt. I mean, obviously, Mark Duplass is awesome. That's, that's, we're just going to call that a given on yeah. the MacGuffin. That's yeah. like a, a, a fact. But you've got like Emily Blunt mm-hmm. and Rosemary DeWitt in this film. What is it like having the ability to, you know, really selectively start selectively casting everyone you want in a film? You know, when you're smaller doing really indie stuff, you know, it's fun to work with your friends. You know, you think about who you want to be in it. But now you can really sort of let your imagination fly. What What is that like to have that it's flexibility? Awesome. It's really nice. Yeah. I mean, I, I it, getting Emily was kind of high in the sky, but I figured, you know, I mean, you can't get a no <laughs> or yes until you ask and right. it turned out that it was really good timing for her it turned out that the the agent was somebody i knew and and was a big fan of hump day on and um uh and so it was and and so it all kind of the stars aligned and it was just really good timing for her and the other thing i have the ace in my hole is that it's i'm asking in that case i was asking for two weeks of her life as opposed to six months or something you know and it's it's an intense two weeks it's though. an like, intense you, got, you gotta weeks. really cram it it's too. true but it's really fun too yeah. it's it's sort of exhausting and exhilarating but it's super super duper fun so you know you've get you've gotten everything together you're you're making a film and i guess this is true of a question for all of your films at what point do you know that you know you're getting what you want 
I mean, do you do you know that at, like when you're with done with the script or something like mm-hmm. that, you're like, boom, done. Or is Never. there a point while you're filming, you're like, okay, I feel like we're on the right track. Or is it not until the end it's, when you finished editing that you're like, okay, I think, oh, yeah. I think we're good. Oh, it's I'd definitely like the it. editing. I mean, editing is my, that's my comfort zone mm. because that's where I started. So um, I don't feel like, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be a filmmaker and not be an editor um, because I know I'm always thinking like an editor on the set. And so I'm going with, I mean, it's nice now having had a few experiences under my belt, I can kind of... I've learned to trust more and more that little voice. You know, you trust your gut or that little voice, whatever you want to call it. There's this thing that will speak to you and tell you that's going to bite you in the butt if you ignore what I'm saying mm. to you right now. Mm. And and it always does, you know. So I always listen to it. And if I know I need to reshoot a scene, you know, I will push really hard to make that happen because, you know, or if I know I need to do, I I not I can't stop shooting this particular scene until I get this one moment right, you know. Um, then I listen to that voice because it tends to tends to tell me the right thing, and and then if that's what it's really all about, it's trusting your instinct and trusting your your gut. And what is it like trying to balance the drama and the comedy? Because in a lot of ways, you know, there's a lot of comedy in your sister sister, but there's also a lot of drama. You know, right off the bat, you've got <laughs> this death basically yeah. being discussed, and I mean, it's really. Like meaning, there's a lot of meaning, there's yeah. a lot of thoughts. Well, and then at the same time, you're like, you know, two scenes later, like, haha, you know, let's do riding a bicycle on the islands. Like, we're yeah, too- well, both, both Hump Day and your sister, sister, I really didn't know how humorous those films would be, as mm. weirdly as that sound, as weird as that may sound. It, I didn't really set out to make a comedy. Mm. Um, I mean, if you look f- out of Hump Day, people were calling me the female Judd Apatow, which was very, you know, quite an honor. I think his work is incredible. He's setting out in his, you know, famous work, he was setting out to make comedies. Um, and I was not doing that. I was, I'm, I'm in those two films, I was setting out to actually just believably tell a story. Mm. I had a feeling we, we knew that there would be, comedic territory you know but we wouldn't that it was potentially going to be funny but often the 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 scenes that the people in the audience laugh at the hardest are often the most deadly serious on set Mm. we're always going totally straight we're not we're not ever trying to wink or you know set up a joke and do a pratfall like we're really we're really going you know um we're, tr- we're trying to play it as straight as possible. And we're deadly serious about it on set, you know, in terms of the drama of it. It's interesting. So it, the humor comes out of people recognizing, you know, themselves or their mm. friends or, you know, that, that human fallibility. And just like sometimes it's a cringe laugh, you know, and sometimes it's just them being really charming and saying f- things yes. in a charming way. There's a lot of that. It's kind of a combination, but it's all very character based mm. and it's, and, and it's not, and circumstantial and, and sort of realism is, is under, underlying everything well congratulations on being the opening night film at, of sif uh, Thanks, i guess sir. the bigger question though is where can people find out about what's next and about you touchy feely all this stuff i don't know facebook twitters websites anything people should pay attention to uh, well i do have a facebook account i'm about to max out on my friends so um <laughs> i'm not accepting as many people as i at quite the rate that i was but yeah no i'm i'm uh it's well i'll first of all say that we are opening this is the only screening we'll have at SIF is tonight um, of your sister's sister. And I think it's already sold out, but it's going to open theatrically in Seattle on the 15th of June and nationwide, um, either the 15th or the 22nd. So um, it'll be the Harvard exit starting June 15th. So I hope everybody goes to see it there because we want it to, it's, it's hard to have a little sure, movie that totally. you know, break through the noise of all of the stuff that's happening, especially in the summer. Yeah. Um, but people seem to be enjoying it. So I, I feel like if you go go to the make the effort to go to the theater, you'll you'll probably have a pretty good time, don't you think? Oh, yeah, totally. I yeah. definitely. This is the second time I've seen it, so oh, good. That, that oh, speaks awesome. to that right there. Okay, good. Uh, um, so that's happening. Um, your sister, sister's underway in um, editing mode. Touchy feely. I'm sorry. Yeah, touchy feely. Your sister's is long gone. <laughs> I'm long out of the editing room. Touchy feely is going to be hopefully coming out sometime in the next year, and then I'm going to be um, making a movie in festivals anyway, and then I'm going to be making another movie called Laggies. Um, which is the first film I'll make that is written by somebody else, but uh, it feels 
of me. It's a really, I have some good simpatico with Andrew Siegel, the writer. And it, so, and so, yeah, that's got Rebecca so, Hall and Paul Rudd in it. And so that'll wow. happen sometime in the next few months as well, I hope. And, and, um, uh, yeah. Keep tabs on her Facebook. Thanks for having me on yep. your Thank you so much. And podcast. Uh, good luck tonight. Thanks.